Welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, July 8th. Looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean, we see a gale in the Tasman Sea producing 28, maybe 29 foot seas pushing north. Good for Fiji and maybe filtered swell eventually pushing to Hawaii. But other than that, a pretty calm pattern is in control. Let's start getting into the details. As usual, start this week's tour looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales, and when those gales form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough or a push in the jet to the north, specifically in the southern branch of the jet. Here's the northern branch here running you know, roughly on the 30 south latitude line from east to west, but it is the southern branch that is for far more uh, contributing to support for gale development. And right here is a trough, you see it? Not particularly strong, winds maybe uh, 90 knots pushing up into it, but we already know from looking at the significant wave height chart, there's something going on in this area. We assume it's a gale, and we assume it is producing seas, and that is supported by this trough. But to the east, a ridge is in effect. That is, the jet is pushing south, as you can see here, the whole way into Antarctica. That is uh, suppressing support for gale development. Remember, here, this uh, trough would support a clockwise flow aloft in the atmosphere, and in the southern hemisphere, that is the sign of low pressure. And it's also occurring down at the surface. And of course, low pressure generates wind, winds generate seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, turn into swell. Swell, when it hits your beach, produces surf. So, right here, a little area support for low pressure development. Anywhere east of there, for the most part, high pressure and ridge in control, not doing a whole lot. So let's go sort of roll this out. You can see well-pronounced ridge here. The troughs, as we get into Monday, starts easing east, but also kind of falls apart, doesn't do a lot. Look at this, look at this ridge just pushing south into Antarctica as we get into Tuesday. And then notice here, some energy starts building south of the Tasman Sea at early Wednesday. Is that 100, that's about 110 knot winds. Now, right in here, that's a little tiny trough. That isn't much. Probably not, an, probably not a lot to do anything. But then as you get into Thursday, uh, so the ice line is right around here, around 65 south. So there's not much, but there's a little bit of a push here with winds, uh, was that, 110 knots or so. Maybe some support for gale development. And then here is a much more energetic flow, 140 knot winds. Let's see, there we go, to almost 150 knots pushing north. That would help support low pressure, again, southeast of New Zealand as we get into Friday, continuing off into the central Pacific on Saturday. And then, of course, winds die, and so the trough and support for gale development fades with it. And let's go. We're almost here. Here we are into Sunday, but, you know, the trough doesn't completely dissipate. 110 knot winds continue Sunday into Monday, so maybe some renewed support even after that. So the pattern actually, though it's not super great, looks way better than it's been uh, for the past couple of weeks with some support. It looks like the uh, New Zealand swell uh, storm corridor right in this area, right in here, might wake up and then eventually start moving towards the central South Pacific as we get a week out. All right, let's go take a look uh, down at the surface, see what it tells us. Here we are, surface level pressure, surface level winds. Clearly, low pressure was at a 972 millibar low right here with 35 knot winds pushing north to northeast, filling pretty much the Tasman Sea. Certainly, that would generate some seas. And it actually was a bit stronger uh, maybe 12 hours ago, but nothing huge. Still solid nonetheless. Anyway, that pushes in into New Zealand as we get into Sunday night, falls apart. Now, here is another gale cut off from the main uh, flow, sort of a, what we call a cutoff flow, but all fetch is pushing south of no interest there. So let's continue looking. There we go. Here we get into uh, almost Tuesday, an area 35 knot winds. We really want to see 40 or 45 knot winds, but a little bit of fetch pushing under New Zealand, roughing up the ocean surface, and aim pretty well to the northeast. That's important as well. But it isn't until we get into Tuesday, a tiny little low develops here, tiny, even smaller area, 55 knot southwest winds. There you go, pushing off to the east. So that's Gale number one, it fades. Stronger system, 50 knot winds comes uh, behind that. Now the ice line is down here around 65 south, something like that, maybe even a little bit north of that. All this fetch looks to be north of Antarctic ice. That's good. Oh, and there we go. Uh, 55 knot winds as we get into Wednesday night. 
and continuing into almost Thursday morning, still 50 knot winds. Now, most of this is aimed to the east. The ideal setup is fetch pushing to the northeast, especially if you want to target Hawaii. Uh, you get more sideband energy, uh, probably not a lot of sideband energy for Hawaii, but maybe for the U.S. West Coast. Most of this energy looks like it's going to be uh, targeting Central America and South America. Let's see, is there another one behind that? And Yes, sure enough. As we get into Friday, now we're talking almost a week out, small area, 40, 40, uh, 40 knot winds, almost 45 knot winds, and this pushing more to the northeast. So southwest winds and the gale itself lifting northeast. That's the more ideal setup continuing into Sunday. And then look at this, a secondary system develops below that at 18Z on Sunday, again with 40 knot winds. Uh, remember, there's a trough developing here in the central South Pacific, and there we are a week out. So is this believable? Probably not. But you know what? The models have consistently for a couple of days now been suggesting this uh, three-gale pattern pushing under New Zealand. Maybe one of them will do something, maybe even two of them. Uh, it's certainly better than where we're at. We'll take it. Let's go take a look at the wave models, see what effect those winds have on the ocean surface. But before we do that, let's go back in time. We're back to last Sunday, July 1st. Little tiny gale here developed in the South Central uh, Pacific. What is that? 23-foot uh, seas, basically, going to 24 feet, maybe 25 foot. There's 26-foot seas, and at 135 west, the Southern California cutoff is about 118, 117 west, something like that. So look at that still, and also keep your eye over here under the Tasman Sea. So this system starts moving out of the swell window while a new one started developing. This was Monday, Tuesday. We're still almost a week away. Um, so the point being, this one we think has produced small swell. That swell is radiating to the north. Another system pushed under New Zealand. It developed, what is this, 32, 4, 35 foot seas and building to 36 feet, almost 37 feet. Uh, there we go, 35 feet, uh, and continuing now, again, all aimed off to the east, not the ideal setup pushing north. Also notice underneath the controls here, a little tiny gale developed as well on Wednesday. So we'll pull this out here right now. 28-foot seas over here, and 30-foot seas still south of New Zealand. So, and, and things being what they are, we're looking for any sign of any swell energy pushing uh, to the north. So what we saw is one weak system here in the southeast Pacific, 25-foot uh, seas pushing north. A little, maybe 14, 15-second period swell could result from that. Another system under New Zealand with 35-foot seas, so that could make, uh, you know, 18-second period swell, something like that. And then another tiny little system also uh, with 28-foot seas, another little pulse of like 15 or 16-second period swell. So there is... Oh, and yet another one, but this was all aimed off to the east on Friday, and we'll just sort of roll this out just to be complete. And that gets us here, and then here's where we're coming up to almost today, the system moving into the Tasman Sea, 30-foot seas, again, for Fiji. So there's some swell in the water already pushing towards California, two little pulses, and maybe another from the system under New Zealand, and maybe some sideband energy from this New Zealand one might also, well, certainly push into Tahiti and also Hawaii, but size probably expected to be very small. So anyway, now we are uh, looking at the forecast. Remember, we're looking for the pattern developing under New Zealand. There's the first system as we get into Tuesday night. Supposedly near 40-foot seas there, but very small in coverage, all aimed off to the east. Lucky if any any rideable swell de develops from that. But this system now, the second system on Thursday, we're looking at 45, 46-foot seas. Again, off, aimed off to the east, certainly focusing on Central America, South America, but sideband energy as well, possibly up into Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast if it develops and gets a little secondary pulse there, almost starting to push a little bit off to the northeast on Friday. And then another system behind that on the dateline, well to the south, 32-foot seas lifting northeast, continuing. See, it's that northeast push. That really does more than just bulk seas. It, it really helps focus swell energy towards California and Hawaii. And then, let's see, we'll just roll this out. And then sort of fades in the central South Pacific. But still, the model's looking a bit better. 
And while we're at it, let's take a look at wind cell potential. So we're looking at surface level pressure, surface level winds. There was a little fetch of easterly winds here pushing into Hawaii, but that pretty much is fading. It was driven by high pressure here north of the islands, but that high pressure not doing a whole lot. The fetch is right up along the islands, doesn't extend even a couple hundred miles east, no good. Also, there is some fetch in California um, associated with the same sort of high pressure ridging in. Most of the core of the fetch is like off of Morro Bay, Big Sur type area. But still, even up in San Francisco, there were some, you know, chest high, wind swell, short period, junky waves. Better than nothing. Uh, you take what you can get, right? Anyway, so as we get into Monday, that fetch continues along the California coast. And uh, rather uh, calm wind swell pattern continues for Hawaii. We'll just roll this out Tuesday. Now notice the fetch. New high pressure, 1032 millibars, builds, filling the Gulf of Alaska. Fetch builds north up into California, 20, 25 knots, nothing spectacular. And a bit of fetch trying to work its way towards the Hawaiian Islands, but not quite there yet. So we get into Wednesday, 30 knot fetch off of North California. This is maybe good for a uh, wind swell down into yeah, somewhere in Central California. And also notice the fetch trying to build into Hawaii, maybe some wind swell there. And so wind swell, mainly for California. Now notice heat low inland, that should start to generate south winds relative to Central California and maybe Northern California up to you know, almost point arena, maybe something like that. And that continues. Now, here's our fetch into Hawaii as we get into Thursday. Northeast wind swell possible then. That continues. Fetch continues off California, but pretty much off the coast now. Sort of looks like, oh, there we go. It continues. Mainly more Oregon. Not sure how much wind swell will actually result in California. Eddy flow continues. South winds along the coast. There we go. Easterly fetch into Hawaii. Still into Saturday. That continues. And wind swell looks like it's fading out as we get into the weekend for California, focusing instead on Hawaii. That's a week out now. Strong high pressure here over the northwestern Gulf of Alaska, still at 1038 millibars. And we'll just, there we, oops, that's it. We were at 180 hours. 15 knot fetch along the California coast. That's not doing much. You really need 20, 25 knot north winds up here in this area to get wind swell down to California. But it's right over the Hawaiian Islands, 15 knot fetch, maybe even a little bit more. So wind swell there. So the short of it, yeah, wind swell for California. Uh, the early part of the week fading towards the weekend. Conversely, no wind swell for the early part of the week for Hawaii, but building later in the week. All right, what's going on long term? Let's look beyond a week to the next month, two months, maybe three months, maybe more. Madden Julian oscillation helps, uh, helps uh, dictate what's going on there. And certainly... The El Nino Southern Oscillation, we want to see, is El Nino developing? So as usual, we start with the MJO discussion first. We look on the equator. East Pacific here, West Pacific here. Here's the equator. New Guinea there. These are actual winds from the TAO buoy array, a, a series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring uh, presence of El Nino. But you can also get a sense of what's going on with the MJO. We see east winds in control of the East Pacific, but weakening somewhat here in the Western Pacific. When they, uh, when they die or turn westerly, that's a good sign of the active phase of the MJO. And if they continue in that pattern for months, then it's also a sign of El Nino. Looking at anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year, we see yeah, a little bit of easterly arrows. That suggests very weak easterly anomalies in the East Pacific, but it's really this area here, the Kelvin wave generation area from 170 west to 135 east, five degrees north and south of the equator. We see kind of a Kind of a mix. There's a little bit of a, w a westerly arrow, but there's also some easterly arrows. So basically a neutral MJO pattern looks to be setting up here. It's when the winds turn westerly, then that's an indication of indication of the active phase of the MJO. And that, in turn, of course, helps pump energy up into the jet stream. When the jet stream's strong, that helps fuel storm development. And when you have storm development, then you get surf. So what's the pattern been the past five days? Well, okay, let's go look in the Kelvin wave generation area. So from 170 west to 135 east, there's New Guinea right there, five degrees north and south of the equator. The blues and the arrows suggest easterly anomalies. That was on July 2nd. We just sort of, and you see westerly anomalies here, but they're, for the most part, 
north of the Kelvin wave generation area. So we're just we're scanning down here. Yeah, maybe little bits of westerly anomalies in the Kelvin wave generation area, but kind of this mixed bag. It's a little bit more pronounced here now as of the past couple of days, mainly on the dateline, westerly anomalies building a little bit. So what's the forecast? All right, zone of wind anomalies, here we go. So this is differences from normal for this time of year. In, and we're going, so the, uh, I'm sorry, this is the whole planet on one chart. The date line goes right down the middle here. Kelvin wave generation area between these two tick marks you scan down. You see the yellows are westerly anomalies, the blues are easterly anomalies. So you get this kind of a, mainly it looks like the inactive phase of the MJO because we have easterly anomalies until we got to about July 3rd and then westerly anomalies started building. Now here's what's interesting. This model and we're, we're beginning to be suspicious about this particular depectation of the GFS uh, data. It's showing a large, strong, bulbous of easterly anomalies building here on the dateline. Nothing else is showing this. We're not believing it. This chart was down for a week or so, and when it came back, some strange stuff has been going on. So just keep this in your mind. This model says strong easterly anomalies on the dateline with westerly anomalies in the far west Pacific. None of the other models are saying it. So let's continue on. Look at outgoing long wave radiation models. These are pretty good indication of what's going on with the MJO. If you see blue, that means more less sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface see the negative numbers there that's what outgoing long wave radiation is uh, which means more clouds which means low pressure which means the active phase of the mjo and this the statistic model suggests the active phase of the mjo modest but uh continue uh, developing and continuing for the next week into two weeks the dynamic model the GEFS model, that same model that was uh, given, that one chart that was giving us heartburn, is also showing the same thing, only showing that the active phase of the MJO is to build really strong, pretty solidly, up to two weeks out. So we think that other chart, there's just something wrong with it. We're kind of blowing it off right now. We'll probably go write the author and say, hey, we, we suspect, suspect that something's wrong. All right, uh, let's see. Phase diagram charts next up. So assume you're looking this, you're looking down on the North Pole of our planet, and the MJO, active and inactive phases, move from west to east, from the Indian Ocean over the Maritime Continent, across the West Pacific, over the Dateline, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over no North Africa, back to the Indian Ocean, round and round, perpetual cycle. The heavy dot is where the active phase of the MJO is, so basically, let's say over Bali, if it's inside the circle, it's very weak. But the forecast for this, the ECMF model says, it's supposed to build moderately, modestly strong, and start moving to the west, building over into the far west Pacific two weeks out. The uh, GEFS model, same model that uh, suggested uh, erroneously that uh, that something that the opposite was going to happen is also suggesting the active phase of the MJO moving into the West Pacific two weeks out. So the, both these models are pretty much in sync, and this is good news. The 40-day upper level model, okay, so the areas that are yellow are considered the inactive phase of the MJO, uh, not supportive of precipitation, the greens. Supportive of precipitation and therefore the active phase of the MJO suggests the inactive phase here is moving over. Oh, and where's the equator? Right here. There's South America. There's New Guinea. Philippines there. So inactive phase moving out of the Pacific through about you know, the 16th of July. And the active phase building over into the West Pacific, into the East Pacific, probably moving inland uh, mid-August or so, and then some sort of inactive phase trying to develop after that in the far West Pacific, but not making a whole lot of headway through the end of the model run on August 7th. The trusty CFS model, same deal as before. This is the whole plan on one chart. Datelines right here, Kelvin wave generation area between these two tick marks. This is past performance here, and this right here is our current inactive phase of the MJO, and you can see easterly anomalies associated with it. But the interesting part here is from July 7th on, uh, on the dateline, yeah, a little tiny area of easterly anomalies, maybe the next four or five days. That fades out, and then from then on, 
you see westerly anomalies starting to build in coverage. And this only goes out, what is this, one, two, three, four weeks, so a month. So a, we're, the thought is we're entering a regime influenced by westerly anomalies, both in the Kelvin wave generation area and east of the Kelvin wave generation area. And we'll get into that in a second. And then the three-month uh, CFS model, again, 850 millibar winds. These are winds up about 4,700 feet, something like that. Good proxy for what's going on at the surface. Kel uh, Dateline runs right down the middle of the chart. Now, this one, past performance is down here, and the future is forward. And there's something that stands out very clear looking at the forecast, starting out maybe a week or two from now. Look at this, westerly anomalies fully in control of the core of the Kelvin wave generation area and building fairly strong uh, from July, August, September-ish time frame, nonstop, all easterly anomalies. If they are present, they are east of the Kelvin wave generation area. This speaks to perhaps the development of El Nino. All right, so let's overlay the MJO. What's going on? Here's our current inactive phase of the MJO. I'm sorry, actually, this is past performance. So it for the, here's today. It's supposed to move off to the east. A little bit of easterly anomalies on the dateline, maybe for a couple of days. That fades out. As we get into maybe July 12th or so, westerly anomalies start. And then here is one active phase of the MJO, a second active phase of the MJO. We're not even going to call this an inactive phase or that. You just see steady, steady westerly anomalies. These are probably even a westerly wind burst. And what's the point of that? Well, westerly winds on in the Kelvin wave generation area to help take warm water that's in the West Pacific and push it, push it to the east in the form of a Kelvin wave, a big ball of warm water that basically travels under the equator from west to east, uh, eventually erupting uh, off of Ecuador and the Galapagos, and that is the hallmark of El Nino warming in the East Pacific Ocean on the equator, driven by the active phase of the MJO and driven by westerly wind bursts. So what's going on? We'll overlay the low-pass filter. Here you go. And what is this? This solid contour here is basically read it as an atmospheric bias towards low pressure, okay, which is the equivalent of the active phase of the MJO, but not just a single active phase, a nonstop, long-running, continuous uh, active phase with stronger pulses and weaker pulses. This is the hallmark, in essence of El Nino, low pressure in the Kelvin wave generation area. And the cool thing is, not only is it only just one contour line, but it's three contour lines deep. It started, it's actually in control as of now. This is earlier than expected. We've been watching the models. It wasn't supposed to happen for another week or two. It's already decided to occur for whatever reason, holding steady into late October. And that is supposedly what is going to drive these westerly wind bursts. And this is the fuel for the development of El Nino. So just looking, this chart now depicts the uh, strength of previous active phases of the MJO. Doesn't say where it is, just say it's strength. But in 2015, we were in El Nino, you see some pretty strong, solid pulses of the active phase of the MJO. And then here's your, your inactive phases that follow, but they're very weak. And then, then that sort of trickled off. And then where were we last year? Last summer, and you look in here in the spring, the MJO was exceedingly weak. We had no storm production. The surf was pretty much miserable. Um, and it has continued, um, but here is another act strong active phase of the MJO. Now, it didn't necessarily produce surf. It actually did produce some uh, weather and precipitation into California, which was a good thing. Um, what it also did, though, this active phase of the MJO was centered over the West Pacific, produces produced a large Kelvin wave, which is erupting now in the East Pacific. And you see, right, just looking where we are, a little bit more uh, density of active phases of the MJO as compared to this period back here, which was focused on La Nina. This suggests maybe that we're moving into a more El Nino-like regime. All right, enough of the MJO discussion. What's going on in the ocean? West Pacific here, East Pacific here. This is, again, uh, data from the TAO buoy array. These are the anchor lines 
on the TAO buoys themselves. The X's are the actual sensors on the anchor lines, and they help tell us what's going on temperature-wise subsurface in the ocean because we're looking for Kelvin waves or lack of Kelvin waves. Right now, actual water temperatures, yeah, warm, 30 degrees centigrade in the West Pacific, 28 degree isotherm. It had pushed to about... Oh, 148. It's sort of backtracking a little now to about 152 west, something like that. Still, 28 degree isotherm, making some good eastward progress. The 24 degree isotherm, also doing pretty well. A little bit shallower here in the far east Pacific than it was. Let's look at anomalies, try to explain that. Differences from normal for this time of year. All right, here's our Kelvin wave. You go, I don't see a whole lot. Well, look at this. One degree so this whole area here is one degrees above normal. And all it takes is a degree or two to make a giant difference in atmospheric circulation. One or two degrees difference in ocean temperature in the right place can literally affect the uh, uh, the jet stream and the uh, 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 atmospheric circulation around the entire planet. The interesting part here, two degrees above normal, two degrees centigrade above normal. This is our Kelvin wave. It was a lot stronger. It was three, almost up to four degrees at one point here in the East Pacific. But according to this uh, modeled, remember, you don't have all the data. Your data is only where the X's are. You model it to fill in the gaps. But still, much warm water, a river of warm water pushing from the West Pacific to the East Pacific. That suggests that trades, remember, if trades are blowing hard to the east, that basically causes upwelling a lot of cool water in this area. If your overall winds are calmer than normal or westerly, then you get this onslaught of warm water uh, sloshing east, but not on the surface, under the ocean surface. And that's how Kelvin waves they get from the West Pacific to the East Pacific, like a big ball of warm water. And that's what we see here. Let's look at another model depictation of it. Stands out a little bit more. A river of warm water flowing from the West Pacific down 150 meters to the east. What is this? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, about four and a half degrees in pockets, but maybe three and a half to four degrees above normal centigrade. So it's even warmer than that. Pushing to the east, erupting to the surface between about, oh, 105 west to about 150 west. And also off here over in the Dateline area, but it's mainly this water is pushing this way, makes it this far, then gurgles to the surface. We'll see the effects of that in a second. Sea level anomalies, another way to get a sense of what's going on subsurface in the ocean. You take this is JSON 2 satellite data, uh, JSON 2 altimeter, strip out all the waves, strip out all the wind swells, strip out even the tides, and what you see is this little bump on the ocean surface right along the equator here. Zero to five centimeters, maybe maybe six or seven centimeters in here. It's right on the equator that we're interested in. But see this continuous, so what this means is, sorry, uh, warm water at depth, of course, expands a little bit, and that's what causes the bump in the surface. If you had a negative bump, that would, you know, like negative numbers in here, that would suggest cooler water at depth because cooler water contracts. But fortunately, we have warmer water. The death of La Nina, La Nina is over. We're not even talking about that anymore. Now it's all El Nino. This is more confirmation that there is a river of warm water flowing. You can actually see it uh, coming, you know, Philippines off in from the maritime continent, snaking its way through the islands here, bleeding into the Pacific Ocean, and then tracking the whole way across the Pacific un under the Galapagos, erupting along the coast of Ecuador. Upper ocean heat anomalies, upper 300 meters of the ocean surface, same deal back September, October, November last year. Cool water, this is the East Pacific, this is the West Pacific here. Cool water, this is our La Nina, first little Kelvin wave pushed across. Didn't really uh, do much, but it did manage to pretty much take the wind out of La Nina. Upwelling phase of the Kelvin wave cycle. Massive Kelvin wave developed by a strong westerly wind burst in February, uh, fueled by the active phase of the MJO. That same active phase of the MJO that produced precipitation in California it sort of gave us a almost semi-normal amount of rainfall for the year, not really, probably about in central to North California, 65, 68% of normal, something like that. But at least it kept us out of drought mode. But what it did do is create a Kelvin wave, and you see warm water pushing east. It kind of stalled 
Didn't quite make it to Ecuador, but then it got a second burst and pushed on in now and is continuing to date. What we want to see is yet more warm water starting to build up over in here and starting to push east. We think that will happen once we get, if the westerly wind bursts that are forecast by the CFS model develop, then we expect to see that occur in the West Pacific. Probably another month or two out, though. So what happens in the lower levels of the uh, subsurface in the ocean affect what happens on the surface. Remember, we talked about our big Kelvin wave erupting at the surface. Well, look at this. It's pretty obvious. There's Ecuador. There's the Galapagos Island. This is sea surface temperature anomalies. Differences from normal for this time of year. The reds clearly indicate above normal temperatures in this whole area, the whole way out to 160 west. There's Hawaii right there and beyond as well. And the official El Nino monitoring region is not right up here along the coast. But the, an interesting point here, if you watched last week, remember we saw a lot of cool water here off of Peru and Chile. That's dissipating. This area gets really noisy. We, we pay attention to it, but not a whole lot because what can happen locally here has almost no bearing on what goes on further out here. They call this an area the Nino 1.2 area. It gets noisy, does all kinds of stuff, but often it has no bearing on what's going on out here. And in the official El Nino monitoring region from 120 west out to 170, 5 degrees north and south of the equator. So a rather narrow band right here. You know, we, I mean, you really do. There is a area here of cooler water. This is the last little bits of La Nina here fading south of the uh, El Nino monitoring region. But you see a lot of warm water here building Mexico all out. I mean, the whole area is just full. We want to see some build up to the south, but we'll take what we can get. Clearly, we're not in La Nina territory anymore. It appears we're moving towards some sort of an El Nino. The trend the past seven days, again, a noisy depiction. It actually shows, see these blues? That's cooler than normal. Yeah, because there was a massive Kelvin wave, Kelvin wave erupting here, and it's starting to lose some of its energy. It's starting to fade. Not as warm as it was, but you look along the coast of Peru here, you see, and Chile, some warming here. That's that noise that we were talking about in the Nino 1.2 region. It is fading out, getting warmer there, and generally a neutral to warm pattern just the past seven days over this entire region. The backed off view, I mean, you just look at this and you go, the whole planet's oceans are warmer, warmer than normal looking at this, and you want to know that's the truth. It really is. But what we really care about right here is the, the equatorial region, and specifically from 120 west to 170 west, north and south of the equator. So here's our last little bit of La Nina here, fading cool waters. So it's it, it is kind of working its way 5 degrees north and south, so that'd be a line roughly along here, you know. But what happens is you get warm water erupting here. The trades carry it over into the Nino region. We expect that all this will be filled in in the next month or so. And that would be typical of some sort of buildup of El Nino. Now, is this a strong El Nino? No, probably not. Not a super El Nino by any stretch of the imagine. Just a modest, you know, weak little El Nino sort of thing starting to develop. But that's okay. We'll take what we can get, right? So here's the Nino 1.2 region temperatures. You can say, remember we said it's been warming the past week? Sure enough, here it was down here, it was at about minus one and one and a quarter degrees. It's up to minus a third of a degree, 0 0.330 today. So some warming there, but this is just noise region. We're not too concerned with that. This is the area we're really concerned with. The Nino 3.4 region current temperatures plus a third of a degree, 0 0.323 right there. Uh, it was actually up a little bit warmer than that, 0.45 or something like that. You know, but you see it goes through these cycles. The MJO winds, a variety of things sort of, uh, you know, affect it on a day-to-day -day basis. But looking back at the trend, we were down at about almost 0.75 a degree, three, uh, three quarters of a degree below normal in mid to late April. And where are we now? Uh, we're on the opposite end of that spectrum now, and the trend is continuing upward, driven by westerly wind bursts, the MJO, all these things we talk about that I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing, but you you monitor this stuff week after week, year after year, you get, definitely get to see these long-term cycles 
in action. And that's what really drives surf and snow and everything else. So you need, you know, if you just follow this, uh, if you read the headlines of the news every day and you, you just look at the headlines and don't get how it's all connected, you, it, you get kind of misdirected on what's really important. It's the long-term trends and how does everything fit together and what are the long-term cycles. That's what helps you make good long-term decisions. So we have the Kelvin wave erupting in the East Pacific. We have what appears to be a building uh, low pressure bias in the Kelvin wave generation area. The models are suggesting that westerly, more westerly wind bursts are coming. So what's going on in the atmosphere? Is there any uh, empirical data that suggests that something's changing? The answer is yes. So we look at the Southern Oscillation Index, difference in pressure between Tahiti and Darwin, and you can see daily contributions okay if the trend is negative and look it's we had a pretty negative little pulse here but long term so we'll look at daily numbers today's number minus 0 0.99 not particularly negative and yeah it went negative there for a couple of days but again what's the long-term trend well you kind of look at this and it's kind of been mixed but it kind of looks like it's mixing more in favor of negative numbers versus positive numbers. Negative numbers suggest if a, for a, you know, maybe a 15, 20 day run, that suggests the active phase of the MJO. More than that, maybe suggests El Nino. The 30 day average, okay, we strip some of the noise out, average 30 days worth of data, and look, look where we were back June 9th. We were positive 2.46. Look where we are now, and the trend is going more negative, minus 7.09, suggesting the active phase of the MJO is on the way. Now, you go even longer term, 90-day trend, what's that mean? Well, if it's, it's negative and stays negative, that suggests El Nino. So we were in the positive range, just barely, 3.78. Yeah, that's almost neutral. If we're positive 10, then I'd say, oh, we're in pretty solid La Nina territory. But what are we doing? Just look at the numbers, steadily going down, down. We're minus 2.32 today. So again, that's not strongly negative. That's not saying El Nino, but the trend is definitely going the right direction. In fact, here's the 30-day SOI graphed out so you can sort of see what's going. You can literally see the pulses of the MJO here. The negative pulses, the downward pulses, are the active phase of the MJO. This is back January 2016. Here was our La Nina. It was, yeah, up to 15 and a couple of little spots, 10, 12, that sort of thing. And here's where we, so we've had, let's see, where was our big February pulse of the active phase of the MJO, inactive phase, another big active phase. Looks like we're moving into yet a third active phase. What we want to see is this, and then the number, the uh, average, the index is actually negative, you know, down about minus five or something like that. But we want to see this drop down to minus 10 or 15, like where it was back here. Then that would suggest El Nino. But it probably will be a bit to get there. Remember, the atmosphere is just now really starting to get a sense that something significant is changing. We still have the hangover from La Nina. Okay, the atmosphere is a big boat. It doesn't turn easy. It takes a while. So there can be lots of noise and stuff going on. It's not till you get this consistent long-term sort of push of multiple active phases, the MJO, Kelvin waves, westerly anomalies in the West Pacific, all that kind of stuff. Then... The atmosphere goes, oh, something's changing in the ocean. I'm going to wake up and respond to it. And then when it does, it really starts responding. So let's add some more noise to the picture. So not only do you have the uh, the Southern Oscillation Index, you have the ESPI Index, which is basically the same thing, only it measures differences in precipitation, actual precipitation in the area north of Darwin, Australia, north of Tahiti here. If the index is negative, it suggests less precipitation here than normal. And so this was up to minus point oh nine or something like that a couple days ago maybe a week ago and we go hey it's almost going to go neutral which means we'll get normal precipitation in this area now past couple of days boom it's falling again minus point five eight meaning still dry in this area dry here and that now this is interesting though because we know we have warm water building here warmer than normal water helps support uh, evaporation. Evaporation makes clouds. Clouds make precipitation, et cetera, et cetera. But this is part of the noise game that's going on. We fully expect this to go to zero uh, in the next couple of weeks, probably. Um, and something's going on. I'm not sure what, but irrespective, we expect if El Nino is developing, this will go zero, and then it'll start going positive. The question is, how far will it go? 
And then finally, the sea surface temperature forecast for the Nino 3.4 region. All right, so where are we? We're in July. Temperatures are a little bit above normal, maybe a third of a degree, something like that. And that's about what the model's saying. Somewhere in that range, there's half a degree, so that'd be about a third of a degree. The interesting part from here forward, per this model, temperatures to go steadily upwards to, what is that, 1 and... 1.3, 1.35 degrees above normal in October, going to 1.5 degrees above normal as we get into the November uh, November time frame. That, if it were to occur in the Nino 3.4 region, would be a pretty solid El Nino. You know, we'll call it modest to maybe moderate, certainly not strong. Cert you know, a strong El Nino would be 2 to two and a quarter that'd be in in super el nino territory but if this were to actually verify and materialize and look at that one degree anomalies even out into nearly april or certainly march that'd be a good el nino that that'd be good for uh, precipitation for california if the warming continues as it is near the galapagos a somewhat eastward displaced uh, el nino not a Madoki el nino so the uh, basically this is what the model's been saying for weeks now um, and it appears that that is what is happening, but it goes and fits and starts. It's not consistent. It's, uh, you know, a step forward, two steps forward, one step back kind of pattern. But certainly we're heading in that direction. So to wrap things up, well, Southern Hemi is kind of trying to wake up. We kind of thought it would as we transition away from La Nina. The later in the summer we get, we think the more the Southern Hemi swell pattern will uh, sort of uh, materialize, focused probably pretty good on the New Zealand corridor. Right now, series of small gales forecast track under New Zealand. There's already some small swell in the water radiating towards California, a little bit less so for Hawaii, and more looks to be in the forecast, which is good news. Nothing huge, and wind swell, of course, as well. So for now... Things are looking better. Our El Nino looks to be on track, developing. All data suggests it. The real key here is big westerly wind bursts. We need that in the, you know, in the next month or two to help build us another Kelvin wave or two to help feed El Nino and build warming on the equator. So that's it for this week. We'll do it again next week. Same time, same channel. Come see whether our drama continues to unfold. All right, we'll do it again next week. Thanks for watching.